I started to become interested in a career in the law in my teens, um, really through um, meeting various lawyers through my parents. Um, I had no lawyers in my family, um, but I had the opportunity when I was at school to undertake a mini pupillage um, at the criminal bar, um, which I did at the tender age of 16. Um, and I learnt very quickly that I loved the advocacy side of the bar, um, I was interested in a career in the bar, um, but um, I didn't want to do criminal law, I was very clear on that. So it helped narrow the field and focus my mind. Um, thereafter, every time I had the opportunity and I would meet someone connected with the law, I would rather precociously just ask them for work experience. And generally they were so shocked <laughs> by this upstart teenager um, that they would, they, would, they would offer it to me um, or accept my, my invitation. And um, so I was, I was able to have experience in um, different sets of chambers and also in um, law firms as well. Um, and when it came to go to university, having spoken to many people, um, I took the view that I would read history. Um, because I was advised by many that actually I could go on to do law and I loved history. Um, so I read history at Durham for three years and again throughout that time um, you know, leveraged the contacts I've made to have further work experience again to focus my mind on what I wanted to do. Um, and I also tried work experience in other fields um, such as broadcasting and journalism which I thought might be interesting to me um, and I decided they weren't. Um, and then in my final year I applied to do the CPE. I did the conversion course in London um, and then I went to bar school. At the time of doing the CPE, I was still not sure about whether I go to the bar or go to a law firm. In my heart, I wanted to go to the bar or thought I did. Um, and, um, but I didn't have the confidence in many respects. You know, what was a sort of girl like me going to do at the bar? Um, and everyone just seemed incredibly clever and um, incredibly, um, incredibly Oxbridge and frankly incredibly male. Um, so, but eventually I had the guts, so I did it, and I, I, I went to, I, I applied for the bar vacation course, I did it, um, I did well on it, um, I applied for th 35 million pupillages like everybody else, um, and I was fortunate enough to get actually a couple, and I started life at the commercial bar um, after I was called to the bar in 1996. Pupillage was, um, was, was, was hard work and um, I learnt an enormous amount. You're very much in the hands of your pupil master, by which I mean if you have a good pupil master, um, you've got fab fabulous exposure. Um, it, it wasn't what I was quite expecting. It was very, very isolated and um, you would be sitting in the room for hours drafting, researching, analysing, but with very limited interaction. And even when you went to court, your interaction with the client, or had a con, was, was limited. Um, and that surprised me, and I felt it was quite isolating as well. Um, I think the challenges were, there were very, very few female role models, so it was, it was very, very male, um, very traditional. We weren't allowed to wear trousers, <laughs> I remember that much. Um, and and you, know, you, again, felt a little bit, I felt a little bit like an interloper. Um, and, but the upside was I learned the most enormous amount. I had the most fantastic experience um, in terms of substantive law. And it gave me a unique perspective into practicing law, which I still have today, albeit that I now sit on the law firm side. Um, both as an advocate um, and also as um, as you know as, as as a lawyer. What was interesting about my my time at, at WildSat was it taught me, as I've learnt throughout my career, that you do better in a career in, in, in an environment in which you're going to thrive. And I really thrived in that law firm environment. It was very very collegiate. Um, I enjoyed working with teams, I enjoyed working with the clients. But at that time, which was what, late 90s, early 2000, um, there was a, you know, the, the US firms had really started to gain traction. And we started to see that move from um, of, of established and successful English practitioners and partners moving to US firms. So it felt a bit like, it, it felt like an opportunity but it felt like something which wasn't going to be too risky. 
Um, when I said I was going to a US firm at that time, they all thought I was completely mad. Um, and I kind of took the view of what's the worst that can happen. If it doesn't work, I can go back into a UK firm um, um, after that. So, um, so I joined um, Wild Gottschall and um, Pam Maxwell. I always knew that I wanted to get to the top of my field. Um, I didn't know that I would necessarily get there. Um, and um, what I did was to work incredibly hard, um, look at opportunities, but also be proactive about my career. Um, so when I went to Wild Gotcha, what were the sort of significant... One was when, um, I mean, I had huge opportunities there, when Enron collapsed, and um, we acted for Ectric, which was a trading arc over here. Uh, and that exposed me to a level of um, crisis management, litigation, being out of my comfort zone in a way I'd never been exposed to before. I learned a huge amount about that. Another was a big case I did for um, an Italian company um, where, again, I was, it was English law governed, but the, the key stakeholders were in New York and I was dispatched to New York, my first trip to the States at 26. Um, and, you know, I was given a room to um, basically cross-examine the CFO and the CEO um, and the partners there and let me do it. And again, I was just given this huge amount of um, opportunity and responsibility. Um, those are a couple of the things that really sort of, you know, marked out in terms of cases. In terms of, 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 of practice and, and other skills, you know, what Wild Gottschall gave to me was the opportunity to be part of something that was growing, and in particular the litigation group that, or disputes group that was growing at that time. Um, I was a second litigator through the door, and I learned there that um, where there aren't sort of huge established structures, there are opportunities. And what I loved about it is if I came up with an idea, they would endorse it and they would support it. Um, so whether it was business development um, initiatives, whether it was um, it was legal initiatives or the like, you know, they were as long as it was sensible and proportionate, they absolutely loved it and they enabled me to sort of think very differently about how I practiced and what my career was. It wasn't just about sitting down doing my work, it was about building something. No, no, completely outside my comfort zone. I mean, but that's how you learn. And unless you're pushed out of your comfort zone, you don't learn. And if you're always playing safe um, and doing everything you know you can already do, and just going up incrementally, you won't make those leaps. Um, so yeah, I know I was out of my comfort zone. Did I wake up at three in the morning? Yes. Do I still wake up at three o'clock in the morning? Yes. Worrying and thinking and analysing. But that is, that is how you grow and that's how you develop. And I would much rather have that than be sitting still or just sort of going very slowly and, you know, and, and, and not being developing at a faster pace. It was quite carefully planned. Um, what I enjoyed at Wild Gotcha, having done the sort of you know, rural investment banking finance work at Wild Sat, at Wild Gotcha I had the opportunity to really broaden my remit, remit to sort of commercial education. So whilst I was doing a lot of work in the finance space and insolvency and um, banking space, at the same time I was also doing insurance, I was doing reinsurance, I was doing commercial. Um, and I liked that. And I say to associates now, it's really important to have that broad grounding in your earlier years and not be too focused on a particular area. However, I got to the stage that I wanted to go back to my finance roots and, and financial disputes. Um, and um, Bingham at that stage, again, was up, although it'd been in London for 40 years, but also was up and coming and growing. And um, again, I was the first litigator in the door at Bingham McCutcheon, and they'd been looking um, for some time. And for me, it was the opportunity to build up the litigation practice whilst really refocusing on the finance side of my practice. I joined as a senior associate, although I was only about five years qualified, I don't know how long, um, um, or six years qualified at that stage. Um, and Actually, what was important to me when I was there is, is there work there? Are there clients I can tap on? I didn't have a, a client base at that age or that stage um, that I was going to be bringing over with me, nor would I promise that. Um, but looking at both the US and looking at the UK, what can I leverage off in terms of business? Um, and what they had was a very strong um, funds practice, hedge funds practice, 
a financial institution's practice, a very strong restructuring practice. And I saw opportunity to work closely with the restructuring practice, with the finance practice, and to leverage off those clients. Likewise, in the US, such a very strong um, practice there in terms of disputes, I saw the opportunity to actually work with those clients and, and, and build out the English law offering. So it was a case of what, what does this have, what does this firm have that I can leverage off to help me build? Um, and that, that, that was the key to success. But you know, at that stage, no, I had, I had you know, no, no real clients. Um, I had lots of contacts. But it was, is this an environment where I can build? Is it a cultural fit for me, which is very important to me? And is it somewhere I can thrive? And it, it was all three. I think in, in life, if you go through going, what are you going to do for me and what, you, what you know, how are you going to support me, I think it's the wrong attitude. I think you've got to ask for it, identify what it is you need and answer it. Pre-partnership, um, I made sure that I liaise with who I perceive to be key stakeholders in the business. Um, and I built a relationship with Head Litigation New York, um, only because he came over to London once and I sort of just pounced on him and talked to him. We got on very, very well and I maintained that relationship. And when I went out to New York, I'd always make sure I see him, I saw him and, and he knew what I was doing. And he, he was probably, in today's terms, a mentor for me, but he'd roar with laughter if he if I said he was my mentor, he didn't realise he was my mentor, but he was a key connector. And then within London as well, I made sure that I had relationships with and um, worked with um, who I perceived to be the key stakeholders there. So it wasn't just one person backing me, and the US knew who I was, um, but also I had multiple partners in London backing me, and that was really, really important. Um, I think, you know, to make partner, you need to be operating at partner level before you make partner. Um, that's what I say to people. I'm growing up here, um, and certainly with my cases and my work, I was I was absolutely operating at partner level. Um, I think my early years of partnership were um, were challenging. Um, they were challenging for a number of reasons. But the first few years of partnership were very focused on doing top quality work um, and build continuing to build relationships and you know you know throughout the firm actually as opposed to more broadly. Um, really honing my skills, really looking to sort of you know lead as a partner on my cases. Um, and again I say to most young partners, those early years, you know, no, there is no substitute for really developing your skills and becoming, you know, a talented, talented partner. That's the most important thing. I was chosen um, by management as to go um, to Harvard. Um, they chose two partners a year. It was in the second year they'd done it, and it was their leadership in the law um, course. And that um, sort of changed my perspective enormously. Whereas to that point, I had been managing and building and developing instinctively, looking around me at sort of people who I thought were successful and you know, trying to borrow you know, what they did. Um, going to Harvard um, put proper learning and structure around it. Um, it was also a very confidence boosting um, thing for the firm to do, to choose me. I was the first woman to go in the firm, I was London, um, and it showed they were investing in me um, and you know, believed in me. Um, and that, that was hugely helpful, all confidence building. And I went to Harvard for, for, for this course, which is sort of most, most big US law firms sent their sort of you know, rise in leadership. Um, and it was the most fantastic opportunity. And that is where the sort of real pivot came in terms of management building strategy. And it gave me the confidence um, to, to, to think further about um, pursuing that as part of my career. I think the working world, well, I don't think, I know the working world has changed very significantly from when I started. Um, I think the online world you know, changes our lives. Um, actually, my clients don't care if I'm sitting in the office or if I'm sitting in my home office or, um, frankly, whether I'm in the car going to <laughs> take my child to school, um, as long as I can concentrate and focus on them and I'm accessible to them. Um, so the upside of that is, you know, the world we live in now, I think FaceTime in offices is far less important. Um, 
I think um, I think the downside of that is you're constantly available and you never switch off. You know, my decision to leave Bingham was incredibly difficult, really, really, really hard. But what was interesting and attractive to me was the opportunity to build something from scratch, um, be part of a firm which focuses almost exclusively on disputes, which is obviously my area, um, and to be part of a firm which you know, shared my vision but also my value system as well, which is about absolute excellence in lawyering. And, um, and all the partners here, and from the most senior, um, um, the very senior manager partners, we all lawyer, we're not sort of managers, we, we lawyer first and we're there for our clients first, and that's very important to me. Um, and were there challenges? Yes, there have been challenges. And to that point about being out of your comfort zone and learning, um, I have learned a huge amount in the last two and a half, three years, um, and about myself, but also about how to build a business. Um, when I arrived here, there was um, very little. There was a very small office, and they, we weren't even regulators. So the opportunity I had was to build a business from scratch, not just a you know, client business, but the infrastructure of the business. To me, what is really important and what is key to a successful team um, is diversity. And it's not just diversity in boys and girls, it's diversity in, in personality and in skill set. Um, and one thing I learned at a very, um, I learned in my 30s was that um, my natural inclination is to hire little me's, unconscious bias, uh, <laughs> before the word was even called. So sort of feisty, ambitious young women coming up who I could sort of, you know, reconcile myself with um, and recognise, rather. And, um, and that, that's not a strategy for success. You don't want a whole team of me. Um, just as you don't want a team, a whole team, frankly, of, 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 of white men from the same background. Um, and so here, what I've done is I have really challenged myself in, 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 in building the team and looked at the team as a whole as it's grown. And we absolutely have diversity in sort of in women and men, but also in skill set and personality. So when I have we have a new case come in, you know, I will carefully put together a team of complementary skills. Um, and together I think we do a far better job um, than if we were all similar or the same. Because we look at the problems that we're looking to solve from unique perspectives with unique skill sets. Um, and there'll be three or four of us and we come up with a different way altogether. Um, so that's how I've gone about building it, um, you know, different people, different personalities, different backgrounds, um, and it's been successful um, thus far. Um, I've also, it's also been very important to me to build an environment which is collegiate, uh, and I, I truly mean that, by which I mean a, a, an environment where people value one another. I won't tolerate sharp elbows or you know the culture of the individual. Um, we're all, and I include myself in this. Success here is all of us. It's not down to one person. Um, so that means making sure that people respect that value system, but also there's enough headroom between people, and they're all fighting for the right you know, for a role or, or a voice, um, and they can see a path to grow. Because I want to grow this firm organically as far as possible. Yes, we make lateral hires, but I want to grow from our associate bodies. You know, I know who I want to be making partner up, you know, this year, next year, and the year after. And that that to me is how you grow something that will last and something that is sustainable. L let's say now, um, when I was managing my 30s and was younger, um, I, I, I experienced more resistance, frankly, to, to, to you know, from, from men who were my peers or even my juniors um, who weren't familiar with working with for a woman. Um, what's interesting to me is I think everyone needs to be managed differently. You know, some people, um, you will need to communicate with them in a very direct way in order to get a message across. And others, should you communicate in that way, they'll probably go to pieces. So for me, managing is about doing it on a very sort of individual basis and treating everyone as an individual. Um, I have more confidence now, I think. I had in my 30s where I had, um, you know, was trying to, or was managing certain men, I found it harder. Um, also dealing with some of the male partners as well. 
But now, having gone through that, I've learnt from that, and it, to my mind, it's less of an issue, and, and here it's not an issue at all. Yeah, I suppose if I look back now, I would it would be about having confidence um, and and believing you can do it. Um, it's about not being intimidated, and it's about being resilient. And actually, you know, I think the ability to um, deal with challenges and adversity um, and overcome them is probably the most important thing. Um, and and better still to learn from that. You know, the way I approach it is recognizing that this is you know I'm, I'm coming up to this and and getting my head down and pushing forward just as I did when I came back from my maternity leave and when you come out the other end um, you know and, and you've learned um, and acquired new skills and and you've survived um, that is very empowering indeed so to my younger self I would say be resilient don't expect it to be a smooth path and don't, you don't want it to be a smooth path you won't learn, um, but embrace those challenges and work through them.